everybody. This is Constance with Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am so sorry for the delay. There were some technical things on our side of things for Mysterious Galaxy's side, and I am so sorry, but thank you all for your patience and understanding. I am very excited tonight to introduce to you our two authors for the evening. We are going to have Michael Bradley, and we're celebrating his book, Dead Air. And then we have James Lindholm, and we have Into a Canyon Deep. I am going to go ahead and let them take it away. You guys are in great hands with these amazing authors. And make sure that you add your comments um, down below in the video, because I'm going to be passing on all of your questions to them, and they're going to be answering them for you throughout and at the end of their discussion. So take it away, guys. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, Constance. Um, James, it's a pleasure seeing you again. I know we good did to see the, you uh, too. <laughs> did a uh, video a couple of weeks ago with Camp Cat Books, and uh, it's good to see you see you once again. I know that you're, I think you're like on the West Coast, right? I am. I'm, I'm on the East Coast, so where it's still sunny, as I can see through your window, it's actually getting dark here. <laughs> so probably still warmer there than it is here, though. I would imagine. Um, yeah, it is. It's a little warmer than I'd like it. <laughs> you know, when you watch the news and they go, hey, it's going to be 97 tomorrow. That's, you know, not what I like to hear, but, you know, what can I say? Right. Uh, so I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Michael Bradley. I live, as I mentioned, in the East Coast. Um, my new book, Dead Air, just came out last month in June. It's a novel of suspense. Um, so this is my third book. And um, Dead Air actually kind of has a little bit of... Um, it focuses on the broadcasting, which radio broadcasting, which is actually something that I did for eight years, a long time ago, back when um, CDs and um, actual turntables were actually still in radio stations. So um, I did that for eight years. So a lot of that experience kind of went into this book to create the, the kind of the, the um, atmosphere of uh, what, the, what a life in radio is all about. Um, but Dead Air is actually, it's about uh, Caitlin Ash, who is a top rated radio DJ in the city of Philadelphia. And she has this idyllic life. She's got a lot of, you know, she's got a, new, a fiance. She's got a great group of friends. She's top of, at the top of her career. Um, but she's got this little secret from her childhood that she's spent all of her life running from. Um, and what's started to happen is she gets this sudden flood of anonymous letters at the radio station that kind of threaten her life, that threaten her. Um, and it makes her kind of realize there's somebody else out there that knows her secret, uh, but she doesn't know who. Um, and the letters start to take on a much more murderous turn. And uh, she ends up having to take a, take, make a heading towards a reunion at this one place that she's never wanted to return to. And it's a place called The Shallows. Uh, it's a little uh, pond or a little lake, you could say, over in um, New Jersey that uh, has a part in this childhood um, secret of hers. Um, but the whole whole book takes place and uh, bounces between Philadelphia and as well as rural New Jersey. Um, there's a lot of local references. Um, a lot of the comments I've been getting from readers is that they, they really love the real to, uh, actual references that are in the book. So... Uh, so James, why don't you introduce yourself? And then hey, thanks, Michael. You. Sure. So uh, my name's James, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Sorry for that we got going late. Um, I'm coming to you from Central California, where the sun is still out over my left shoulder, um, and um, I am the I am a practicing marine scientist. I'm actually a professor and department chair at a university and the head of a research dive program. And um, I when we're not stuck in, at home with a global pandemic. I'm actually out in the world doing research, traveling around and, and conducting undersea research, mostly on fish. And I've, to date, I've been to uh, six of the seven continents for research. And one of the things that I've found when I'm out talking to people as I travel around is that many, many people come up to me saying, you know, oh, I always wanted to be a marine scientist, but dot, dot, dot. And then, you know, you fill in whatever after that. And it occurred to me over the years that given the amount of fiction that I read, 
started to occur to me that maybe this is an opportunity for, to, for me to fulfill the, the other dream that I had was actually to, to write the type of novels that I like to read. And so the, the night I got tenure as a professor, I started my first book, which is coming out uh, on August 4th, although the audio book is now available um, on Audible, Into a Canyon Deep. It's actually a re-release, um, heavily re-edited and revised with a new cover uh, with a new publisher, Cam Cath, the publisher is publishing both Michael and I now. It's going to be immediately followed in August, uh, sorry, in September by a sequel, also re-released with a heavily revised ending. And that's called Blood Cold. And then in, in October, a uh, new one, Dead Men Silence, will come out for the first time. So there's going to be a three, in the, over the next three months, three books coming out, which is pretty exciting. And tonight I'll just read a little bit from um, the first book. Back to you, Michael. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I've always wanted to be a, re you know, re <laughs> but I just don't float well. So, you know, <laughs> I just sink to the bottom, which actually thinking about it is probably what you actually do, right? You, you scuba, you do scuba. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the so, time. That's right. Yeah. So, so sinking, sinking is not sinking a bad thing. Sinking to the bottom is sinking is, is a good thing then. The only challenge getting... you want to come back also, right. which, you know, and we have technology to help facilitate that. So, <laughs> well, why don't I read a little bit from, from dead air and then uh, I'll give you, you can go ahead and read from, uh, from your book. Okay. Um, I've chosen uh, a passage that's uh, early on in the book. Um, so just to, to give it the, everybody an understanding is, you know, Caitlin works at this radio station in Philadelphia. So this particular scene takes place when she's coming into work one morning. Um, uh, this is early in the book where she's already been starting to get these threatening letters. Um, uh, but I'll go ahead and read and we'll just uh, let you let everybody go from there. So Caitlin passed the sales office and production studio entering the office set aside for the air personalities. The large open space nicknamed the bullpen featured six office desks in two rows set end to end across the room. The desks were basic, each with an aluminum frame, drawers and laminate desktop. Kevin O'Neill looked up from his laptop and gave Caitlin a quick wave from across the room. His caramel covered, colored hair was brushed back from his forehead, drape, draping down behind his ears. Caitlin halted, staring at the thick strip of white surgical tape that covered his nose. Kevin, what happened? He gave her a tentative smile, racquetball accident. His voice had a nasal twang to it. Spent half the night in the ER. She tilted her head for one moment. She never knew Kevin played racquetball. Looks painful. Not like it was when it happened. The doc said the swelling should go down in 24 hours. The stitches should come out in two weeks. She pointed at the bandage. How long have you got to walk around with that on your nose? He rose from his seat, stepping around the desk. His biceps flexed beneath the sleeves of his polo as he crossed his arms. A few days. Caitlin laughed at the nasal tone in his voice. It's done wonders for your voice, she said. His eyes flashed dark for a moment. It doesn't sound that bad, does it? She crossed the room and stopped at the small square shelves that served as mailboxes for the staff. I'm sure no one noticed. Caitlin reached into her mailbox and extracted the latest copy of Billboard magazine, two envelopes, one white and one manila, and a compact disc. The label on the CD said it, it contained jingles and commercials for Walmart. She slid the CD back in her mailbox. She entered them into the computer later. Caitlin rolled up the magazine and slipped it under her arm. Then she glanced at the two envelopes. The return address of the white envelope was a local charity, probably looking for free publicity. Caitlin shuddered when she glanced at the Manila envelope. She'd seen the hand-printed label numerous times before, and she knew what she'd find within. She leaned back against the nearby desk. The envelope trembled in her hand. Kevin crossed the room and stepped behind her. She felt his warm breath on her neck as, she looked as he looked over her shoulder. He reeked of stale cigarette smoke and she tried not to cringe. Anything the matter, he said. Caitlin's loss of composure was only momentary. Then she smiled, sliding the envelope under her arm with the, with the magazine. She turned to find him standing inches from her, just a tad too close for comfort. She stepped back. It's nothing, just junk mail. Kevin gazed at her for a moment, shrugged his shoulders and returned to his desk. Once seated, his fingers danced across the laptop keyboard. Caitlin moved to her desk at the opposite end of the office and set the mail down that she just collected. Anti-dedication tonight? Kevin stopped typing and glanced across the office. Yep, said Caitlin. 
pulling up the pulling open the left lo uh, lower left drawer of her desk. What are you using this week? Caitlin smiled as she lowered her leather purse into the drawer. Jay Giles Band. Love stinks. Nice one. Caitlin pushed the desk drawer closed. Glad you approve. As Kevin returned to his typing, Caitlin lowered herself into the desk chair and slid the manila envelope across the desk until it rested before her. A chill crept up her spine. Her eyes traced the ink, the black ink on each letter on the address label. The pinpoint lines were straight and sharp and the curves and corners pre precise. The same handwriting on every one of those envelopes she'd received over the past month. She took a deep breath and slid her fingers along the top edge to break the seal. The sheet of paper within was folded just as all the others had been. Laying the paper flat on the desk, her eyes danced over the random magazine clippings that made up the message. Although the clippings were different this time, the words were not. Play Ario Speedwagon for me. You know the song, The Shallows. In an instant, she was there, standing by the water's edge, watching a flashlight sweep over the water's surface, a frantic search in the darkness that she knew would yield nothing. A fan letter, said Kevin. Caitlin whirled around, startled by his voice. She hadn't heard him approach her desk. She refolded the letter, trying to hide its message. He leaned in over her shoulder. His breath was hot on, the neck, on her neck again. It sent a shiver along her spine. Just some cranks, she said. He lifted the letter from between her fingers. She didn't have time to resist and bit her lip as, she, as he gave the message a quick review. Ario Speedwagon, whoever it is, they've got no taste in music. There's nothing wrong with Cronin and company, she responded as she tried to put some space between them, glad to latch onto a conversation about music. Bah, dreaded love much. Kevin dismissed her comment with a wave of his hand as he tossed the letter back on her desk. That's not true. What about take it on the run or keep on loving you? They had some great stuff in their hair day, their hay day, hair day, their hay day. Pish posh. I can't think of a worse, ba worse batch of songs than the crap they turned out in the 80s. He gestured toward the letter. But if someone's going to go to all that trouble to make a request, you better play it for him. Kevin crossed to his desk. He grabbed his coat off the back of the chair. I got to go. Have a good show. He reached the office door and paused. I'll be listening for Ario tonight. Then he disappeared through the door. She watched him leave, glad to be alone for a few minutes. She glanced at the unfolded letter, rereading the words. She knew the song. Ario Speedwagons can't fight this feeling. It had been their song. Who could possibly know the connection between that song and the shallows? Who the hell was sending these letters? Caitlin gathered up the letter and crossed the room to the office shredder. A few moments later, the letter was gone. So there's an interesting tidbit about this. Um, just real quick, this particular scene is uh, in the early on. It mentioned the anti-dedication um, song, and the idea was that uh, that uh, it actually came from an, a part of my experience uh, in radio. I used to have, I used to work with a night guy who did what did what we called an anti-dedication once a week, and he he would play like the worst. Um, like the one of those like I hate you type songs instead of the usual you know love songs and dedicated and it was always the idea was hey call in and you know dedicate this song to people that you hate and uh, so it just had to go into the book so it ended up there I have no idea if the guy is still doing it I don't even know where he works anymore but um, it was pretty funny to hear some of the dedications that used to come out each night so how about you you want me to take over for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So I should set this up. Um, I failed to mention this at the beginning. Um, so all three of my novels are a series um, with a revolving set of characters led by a marine scientist by the name of Chris Black. And um, I I've always been captivated by reading things like legal thrillers and medical thrillers and, of course, spy thrillers where enough of the content is provided to make you feel like you're part of it, but you're not overwhelmed by it. I mean, legalese can get overwhelming, medical stuff can get overwhelming. So in this case, I didn't wanna set up a series of novels where the scientists solve the problem of global climate change because that's, while interesting professionally, not interesting in a fictional sense for me. So basically what I have is a team of people out doing the work that they normally do and by virtue of a set of circumstances that differs by, between novels, they come into contact with some bad actors. And uh, the other thing that fascinates me, having been the recipient of death threats myself over the years as a result of the science, um, 
exploring what would happen if the scientists didn't back off when the bad actors pressed them. So I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter of Into a Canyon Deep, which takes place in the Carmel Submarine Canyon, which is about um, a mile and a quarter um, just down the hill from where I'm sitting right now. It's a deep water canyon that comes right up the shore. Literally, it's 100 feet offshore. You can dive over the head of it, look down into the abyss. And if you do dove with weights, you could disappear in that abyss very quickly. OK, so this is chapter one. Spinning into the wake of the receding fishing vessel Lizzie J, Joe Rothberg's many wounds bled steadily. A blue bioluminescent aura enveloped him as the movement of his sinking body agitated thousands of small planktonic organisms. Only minutes before, he'd watched the sleeves of his favorite sweatshirt slowly wick salt water up his partially submerged arms as he dangled from a half inch nylon line on the boat's bow. Hanging boat by his broken right leg, Joe's head was only inches from the cool ocean surface. He knew it was supposed to be pretty deep out there above the Carmel Canyon. The captain had said more than 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. He saw and smelled the beach close by, even in the pitch black of the moonless spring night. Maybe if I yell, he hoped, someone will help. Maybe someone will call the police or the Coast Guard. Joe had tried to focus his, beyond the steady drum of the pulse beating in his ears, tried to remember the tricks his counselor had taught him when he was a kid, tricks to control the jumble of random ideas bouncing around his head. Identify what I'm feeling. Identify what I'm feeling. Identify what I'm, fuck, what am I doing out here? The dark waters didn't respond. He kept coming back to the fact that he'd been helping dump toxic waste into the ocean. Sarah's gonna kill me if she finds out, he thought. Not cool. Joe had felt the disappointment of Sarah, his parents, even his old counselor, Margaret Black, more intensely than the growing strain on his broken leg. His high school glory days were long gone. At least that's what he had realized when two weeks earlier he'd come home to find Kevin O'Grady wearing camouflage pants, an expensive suede jacket and what looked like military boots, sitting in the living room talking with Sarah. The baby was resting in the bouncy seat beside the couch. They'd been sitting on the same couch, not across from each other as Joe would have done if he'd been visiting somebody else's wife. He knew that Sarah and Kevin had dated back in high school. In fact, there'd been rumors that Kevin was the father of Sarah's first baby the one she'd aborted. What hurt Joe most was that when, what he'd seen those first few seconds after he came in the door. Sarah had been smiling. There was a light in her eyes that he hadn't noticed in years. What he wouldn't give to see that light again and to be the reason for it. Instead, he saw the light go out when he entered. With Grady's size, the living room literally appeared to shrink with him in it. And the fact that he was seriously mean kept Joe's pain and irritation at bay. Even if Joe had wanted to make some kind of point that day to assert his husbandly authority, to try and earn back some of the respect from his wife, he knew it wouldn't have mattered. O'Grady could beat the shit out of him, no problem. The next surprise came when O'Grady had turned to Joe that day and offered him a job. Sure, most of the spiel had been total crap offered up for Sarah's benefit. O'Grady had made up some story about a business partner needing help at night in a new warehouse in the neighboring seaside. The job had brought off Joe offshore for the eighth time in the past two weeks. He'd been supervising the disposal of toxic waste. Not so much supervising as standing around, actually. Joe's primary responsibility had been to match each barrel with the list of Grady had given him and to make sure that each one made it over the side before the boat headed back in. The Grady's boss had apparently wanted a white man overseeing the dumping operations, even if that white man had far less experience with this type of work than anyone else on board. Though Grady's business partner, if that's what he was, hired dozens of Mexican, Asian, and African-American workers. Down deep, Joe had figured he was still just a racist dick. Joe's regrets about working for a guy like that and dumping waste into the ocean to boot had grown with each trip down from Monterey. Two nights ago on his seventh trip, he realized that he had to do something. He couldn't quit, he needed the money too badly. And he didn't want to call the cops since he didn't want to get arrested. And anyway, he'd overheard a Grady talking about the fact that his boss, owned the cops, so that was a dead end. But he could try to alert someone to what was going on out there. After some contemplation, a solution had come to him. Early in the evening, he had earlier in the evening, he had stopped by the FedEx store in Monterey before coming down to the dock. He felt much better about everything after that stop. He would take his money from tonight and be done with it. He would never have to think about Kevin O'Grady again. 
Tonight was perfectly calm, which Joe knew was unusual for this time of year. Strong northwesterly winds tended to blow hard day and night. So instead of supervising, he'd spent much of the time leaning on the rail, enjoying the lights shimmering on the glassy ocean surface as cars went speeding down California Highway 1. Below him, little bursts of blue light formed and then exploded under the surface like fireworks. Bioluma something or other, he was told. An accidental cough from one of the crewmen as they approached him, coming at him from the stern, alerted him. Joe noted that all the evening's barrel had been dumped, and then he realized that the five crewmen were all carrying clubs. Oh shit, had they figured out he betrayed them? Not waiting for an answer, Joe moved as fast as he could, climbing out onto the narrow rail that surrounded the boat and shimmying along the outside of the wheelhouse as he moved towards the bow. His chubby, sweaty fingers moved along the wooden trim while his old Converse high tops kept pace below them. The lifeboat mounted on the bow might be his chance to escape. The relief Joe experienced upon reaching the bow ahead of his pursuers was short-lived. O'Grady, whom Joe hadn't realized was on board tonight, came forward from the other side of the wheelhouse carrying his aluminum baseball bat. End of the line, Joey boy, O'Grady said. No loose ends. At that point, Joe, still panting from his exertion, had given in to the inevitable. There was no way he was going to get out of this. No way. His shoulders slumped, and he made no effort to dodge either the incoming bat or the kick that followed. But Grady had obviously not waited to hear the splash, nor had he looked over the side. Had he done so, he'd have seen Joe's body snagged on that line running from the bow to the stern. Joe felt the boat's powerful engines come to life through the barnacle-encrusted hull before he heard them. Could he make it all the way back to the port in this position, he wondered? Maybe he could sneak away once the boat was tied up back at the fish pier. As the boat began the return trip to Monterey, the bow lifted and then dipped into the oncoming swells. The first swell to brush the hull grabbed Joe from the line and swept him aft towards the stern of the, stern of the boat. The chill of the 55-degree water barely registered as Joe was briefly free of the boat. The surge of adrenaline accompanying his release had armored him against the pain of being dragged along the weathered hull. Joe had just enough time to consider his situation before he'd been drawn under the boat as he approached the stern. Within seconds, he was sucked into the port side propeller, which had been moving at full throttle. The propeller had ripped open Joe's left thigh, nearly severed his right arm, and sliced deeply into his scalp. Adrift and sinking fast, the, nap, the last synapse of Joe's dying brain fired in an expression of hope that Chris Black, somebody he'd not spoken to in over 20 years, would know what to do with the package Joe had sent him. All right. Nice. nice. There we go. A little, little gruesome <laughs> right at the end there. What's that? <laughs> a little yeah. gruesome right at the end. You know? I should have prepped everybody for that. Things happen. Bad things tend to happen in the first chapter of these novels. It uh, kind of sets everything <laughs> up. <laughs> so, so I, I do have to. I have to ask. Um, you said that the where this takes place is right near you. How how deep have you gone in that? Um, what it, what was it called again? The canyon, the Carmel Canyon. canyon. Yeah. So as a scuba diver, I've been down to 165 feet, um, but using a robot, a, ro a remotely operated vehicle like they'll do in this book, we've been down to the bottom, which is 6,000 feet out at its maximum depth. And we've followed it from 6,000 feet all the way up to the shoreline. It's really, this, this doesn't happen that many places in the world where you have the deep sea literally feet offshore of land. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool opportunity to have right here. Oh, cool. Awesome. Do we have any questions coming in? Do you see? Yeah, we've yeah we've actually got several questions in the chat. Um, All right. So it's, it's like the first one says, um, since both of you have so much experience from your other professions in this book, did it make it harder or, e or easier to write the stories while keeping them relatable to the readers? You want to take that uh, one first? Yeah. So I, you know, for me, um, I think the 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 biggest part about radio uh in in my books was in my book was trying to give the reader a, a sense of what it's like to be in broadcasting without overwhelming overwhelming them with information about um you know the control boards and the technology and you know all the the politics and all the things that go on at, around the radio station as well because i mean there's a like any other business there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens on a daily basis and uh, from selling commercials and things like that that would just bore the reader completely so for me it was it was almost a case of having to try to dumb it down a little bit 
um, or just give just enough information to give that atmosphere without overwhelming the, um, the reader with too much information. One of the first, the first draft of Dead Air, um, I got a little too detailed about the type of microphone and what the control board looks like <laughs> and all this stuff. And I had um, some, uh, some early readers go, I don't need to know all that detail. Just tell me she pulled the microphone down and, and go from there. So how about yeah, that's, you? Um, I had a similar experience with that first book. Um, and I, I actually sought out the input of people. Like I had the good fortune to have lunch one time with Clive Custler, who's now recently deceased, but a, a great writer of ocean thrillers. Um, and he gave me some insights. And then I also wrote to another favorite actor, I mean, um, writer of mine named John Sanford, who writes um, thrillers set up in Minnesota area. Both of them emphasized that I was going to have to cut out more than I ever wanted to of science. And I think it was, it was the, I had the same experience with the first book. It's, it'd been down too deep into the minutia and it was um, too much for the audience. So I hope yeah. we, it's through a couple of rounds of editing is now a little bit more accessible, enough to get you to feel like you're there, but not overwhelm you with the tedium. Okay. We've got another question, and this is specific to you. Um, so you mentioned that you've gotten death threats. Have you, have any of them inspired any of your books? Uh, not yet, but well, the general premise has, like I mentioned, you know, I think I mentioned this in this one reading we did a couple weeks ago. I was really enthusiastic about Quentin Tarantino movies. And one of the early pitches I heard for some of his movies is what happens when the bad guys meet the badder guys. And so what's, I, what I've always been interested by is, you know, although for the most part only in, in fiction, um, what would happen if next time scientists get death threats against them, they fight back? <laughs> you know, I think that would be, <laughs> so um, none of the bad actors that I'm, that Chris Black deals with in these first three books are much worse than any of the people I've ever interacted with. So by comparison, they're dealing with things that are much worse than mine. But in spirit, yes, there is some sense that Gee, instead of cowering and retreating to their objectivity and their logic, I'd like some day for a scientist to say, you know what? <laughs> and then <laughs> and that's what happens to some extent in these books. I'll admit. You know, it's it's funny because because um, my book is about a stalker, um, and uh, this is one of the things that some people have asked me is, you know, well, when you were in broadcasting, did you ever ever have a stalker? And I never, yeah. I never had the privilege of having. <laughs> a stalker when I was in broadcasting. I mean, you had some fanatical fans that you would hear call in a lot, or they'd show up at every one of your live broadcasts, but it was never it was never anything significant. But I, I have known a couple uh, radio people who had borderline fanatical fan slash stalkers who, you know, just kind of try to push their way into your life just a little bit too much. But never to the degree that Caitlin, my protagonist in my book, ends up suffering with. So, um, so who knows, um, now that you're, now, you know, with the publication of this book, you, better, you, you may wanna keep yourself, um, you know, walk down the sidewalk a little serpentine and, and right, vary yes. your technique. Right? <laughs> you I mean, every luckily, day. <laughs> luckily, I'm not on the air anymore. So, I, you know, somebody would have to really work to find me. So, um, hey. So let's see, we got another question here. What inspired you to be a writer and what has it been like managing your writing career and a full-time job? Mm. So I'll let you start with this one. Okay, um, well, it's a challenge, but um, well, what inspired me to be a writer, I think is reading. I mean, I started reading very early and I read all the things that young kids do. Of course, we didn't have Harry Potter and all that stuff, but we had J.R.R. Tolkien. I read a lot, all that stuff early and then, um, as this, this first book is dedicated to my mom, actually, because she started, she gave me Robert Ludlum novels when I was in fourth grade. So I started reading <laughs> Robert, Robert Ludlum really early. And um, so, you know, I have always just enjoyed um, the kind of, you know, I read a lot, but the, the kind of thriller genre has always been really satisfying for me. So that's what inspired me. And I, I suppose in some backward way, inspired me to take on a career or to take the time to get to a point where I could do this as a career and actually have adventures myself. But the second part, balancing it as a full-time job and, and a full-time job is no picnic. I mean, a full-time science job is basically could be 24 seven anyway. Um, but 
And I get criticized by some of my colleagues for spending time writing fiction and not spending that same time doing science. But, you know, there's got to be a limit. And I, it gives me so much joy that I, it, you know, the balance is um, so far is achievable. Um, I think if you really scrutinize, you can find things that have changed as a result of the time I spent on the fiction. But it's so satisfying that I'm going to keep plowing forward. What about you? So I started writing when I was in high school. Um, and wrote all through high school. And I actually found some of the stuff that I wrote uh, in a box, uh, I don't know, about a year ago on the old dot, dot, uh, dot matrix paper, you know, with the holes down the yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lettering was starting to fade. Um, and I was kind of reading through it and I was really surprised at how bad of a writer I was in high school. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of, when I got into broadcasting, I stopped, I actually stopped writing for a long, long time. And Started, I picked it up again, I guess about 12 years ago and just started started experimenting with it, starting to play with it and um, started with a couple of short stories and then started writing things novella length and uh, eventually got to the point where I was able to write the novels. And it, it's become at this point for me, almost a, um, a physical manis manifestation where if, if I don't write for a long time, I get grumpy, I get it's, you know, there's almost like these physical symptoms when I, the longer I don't write, the more, you know, the more that I start to, you know, my wife says, you need to just go and write. <laughs> so, um, and it's, and I'm the same way with you, with you is managing the writing and the full-time job. Cause it's, it, it's, it's a real, it's a balancing act. It's like, you know, when do I have the time to write? When do I have the time? You know, I, I, I've got to devote to time to work because obviously that pays my bills and keeps the roof over my head. Um, and then I got to squeeze the time in for writing, um, which is a lot harder to do than it, you know, some people would think. You'd think, oh, you can just come, come home from work every night and sit down and write. Well, it's not always, doesn't always work that way. I've got two dogs that require, you know, quite a bit of attention. And yep. So, um, you know, it, it, it's just a balancing act, like you said, it really is. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the things we were talking about like a couple weeks ago that I mentioned is that even if I'm not, I'm not writing every day. That just, does, unfortunately, okay. it doesn't work that way for me, but I am thinking about it every day. So book four is, is already, I'm ruminating on book four. And as we were talking beforehand, you've already got one in the works. Yeah. But minimally, if I'm not writing, at least I'm thinking and strategizing. So, that, so it is never far from my mind these days. Yeah. So next question here. Both your books are versions of thrillers or action novels. Um, it says here, I generally run away from stories that scare me. <laughs> how did both? How did you both find yourself writing them? Were you always drawn to stories of action, mystery, and thrills? Um, I think for me, I've always enjoyed the the mystery and thriller genre, even as a as a teenager. Um, I got hooked on that early on. With I don't know if you remember, there was a PBS had a Sherlock Holmes series starring Jerry yeah. Brett. Yep. And that got me into the Conan Doyle books. And then from there, it just expanded out into, you know, you know, more modern stuff, Raymond Chandler, Leslie Charteris, um, Ian Fleming. And then from there, I've gotten into much more of the modern stuff as well with uh, Lisa Unger um, and, and other writers like that. I've just always been drawn to that sort of thing. I mean, I did enjoy science fiction for a little while, but you know, I've always been come back to the mysteries and came back to the thrillers uh, more than anything else. I think that's, I would probably have a similar answer is that I really, something about the genre, and I think it's actually a love of those books, as I mentioned earlier, actually helped scope the direction I took in a professional career too. I do read a lot of different stuff. Um, a couple of my favorite books, like one of my favorite books of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird. I, you know, my daughter and I read that Great every book. year for a number of years. I love that book. Um, and then I'm a big fan of another one of my favorite books is the time the the time traveler's wife amazing touching story so I love a touching story just as much as anybody but I think if you were to review the shelves on behind me and the things that are on my bedside table most of them fall into this kind of thriller genre that I think it just the pace is really enjoying okay so we got a question here how long did it take you to complete your books from idea to sending it out on uh, for submission so I'll let you take that first. So that varied. Um, the first one took a long time. 
the second one took less and the third one took um, even less. So I think it took about a year and a half to write the first one. And it was so detailed that that's why it took that long. And it was also my first effort. The second one, um, I think I felt like I got a better sense of the pacing. And so I moved through it a little quicker. The third one, I'm, actually, I'm very fortunate to have such a great editor at CamCat Publishing because I raced through so fast that I had to spend much more time going putting the context back in because I was just racing through the action scenes. So it's um it's a little bit, you know, I think my hope is that I can get one done a year, basically, despite all the other stuff that's going on. What's yeah. your experience in that regard? So I, it's it mine's been usually it takes me about a, a year to write um from uh concept into final draft that's being submitted. And then of course there's the uh the whole time it takes to do the editing and get it, you know, get the book out there uh, and printed and published. Uh, so for me, it's usually roughly nine months to a year to get the final draft ready. Um, Dead Air took me uh, about 10 months to get uh, ready before I started sending it out. And then, and then, then of course, there's the time for submissions and so forth. But I'm hoping that this new one um, that I can get that down to maybe eight months, uh, if, you know, if I'm lucky <laughs> and if all the stars align and everything like that. <laughs> so, yep. um, it's interesting, isn't it? So I was, we were both participating in that virtual conference last year, last week, Thriller yeah. Fest. And I, I, I listened to an interview with Scott Turow, one of my favorite authors, you know, classic legal thriller. And he wrote like the presumed innocent while he was still a U.S. attorney. Right. Yeah. And he wrote it only while he was riding on a subway. And he was pointing out that many of his colleagues produce one a, one a year. He just doesn't do that. It takes him, you know, two years or longer. And he just, he has his process and that's what he does. And I appreciate that. So everybody's got a little bit of a different process. So for, uh, for the books, what was the hardest scene that you had to write? What's, and there's actually a two-part question here. What's the hardest scene to write? And what scene gave you the most joy? <laughs> You want to take that or you want me to? I, I, I can start. Um, okay. I was hoping that you would take it first so I could think about this. Uh, Not sure. I have an answer. <laughs> you, you have an answer? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So the hardest scene to write is one I haven't written yet, and that's a sex scene. I've actually had, you know, I'm, <laughs> I mentioned I'm a professor, right? And so I have students working with me on research and in my classes. And, you know, a former graduate student came up to me and really advocated for you know, more of that in these books. And I just think, you know, I, you know, at least thus far, that is not for me. There is, um, I, you know, I've, I've read it, you know, I put up with it when I encountered it in the books that I read, but I don't know that I will ever be going that deep into that area. But I got some unnatural glee, I would say, for writing the first chapter of the second book, which in, takes place in South Africa. And unfortunately, like the first chapter of the book I just read, Unfortunately, something bad happens to somebody, but the way in which it happens was um, as something I experienced directly um, myself, and it I gave me some kind of unnatural glee. That's all I'll say. <laughs> so for me, um, I think the hardest scene to write was the big climactic scene near the end that takes place um, at a place called The Shallows. And it was really hard to write primarily because getting the logistics right you know there's a lot of action that's going on there's a lot of stuff that's happening got three characters at all converging um and i had i really went back and forth with that a lot trying to get all the logistics right and everything okay so and so did this and so that causes that and trying to get all that so that was the hardest scene and oddly enough the scene that i got the most joy out of writing um there's a scene i'm going to try not to give too much away but there is a scene where I was writing from first the first person of the stalker um, with the first kill in the book. Um, and I got so much joy out of, maybe unnatural joy, out of writing all the, the feelings and all the senses um, of that first kill. Um, it's really strange, but it was, I've never written that sort of stuff in first person before. So it was really interesting to have to get into the head of the killer and really, what is that going to feel like? What is that going to smell like? What is this going to do to somebody whose mind is already 
on on the edge of going over. Um, so I, that was probably I got the most joy. It's very unnatural joy, I know, and it makes me sound like a really <laughs> sick person. But you know, I think that was that was one of the big ones. Um, so I think we've got a couple more questions, uh, but I think we're running out of time. So um, we'll hit this one question here, okay. and then we'll. Uh, there's two that are one for each of us. So we'll wrap up. So we'll start with this one. When when you get inspiration for a book, do you have to write it down right away, or do you let it percolate in your head for a while? What do you? Uh, in my case, I have um, a series. So this is the, I'm already writing book four of the series, and I have the, the, the broad plots in my mind of three more after that. And I imagine that if COVID, when we're released from COVID and back out in the world and traveling again, doing science, some uh, more ideas will come. So I. I kind of, I tend to write them down. I am an outliner. So I write stuff down. I've got files on forthcoming books that haven't been touched other than a title and maybe an idea. You write that stuff, type of stuff down? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, um, I have, a, I have a, I have about, I think maybe 20, 20 or 30 ideas that I've gotten these little, little notes on that I've never really developed. Um, you'll get this idea. I'll think about, oh, this might be a good idea. You write it, I write it down and then it just kind of sits there for a long time. Um, I, I am a very short outliner. So my outlines are usually like one, one sentence per chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I'm done, I'm usually about 70% close to the outline. But, um, but for me, it's, it's when an idea comes, I'll write down the idea. I may think about it a little bit more before I write the idea down and expand upon it. But uh, sadly, I've got more ideas than I have time to write. So that's not a bad so, problem to have though, really. No, it's not, it's <laughs> not. But, but you know, I've got some, I've got some ideas that, is, that are like five or six years old that, you know, you go back and you look at them and you're like, what was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did I mean by that? I don't understand. Right. <laughs> so I think we, we're running out of time. So there's two yeah. more questions here, one for you and one for me. Okay. Um, so I think we'll, we'll do mine real quick because it's really easy. Michael, okay. have you ever experienced dead air? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for anybody who doesn't know what dead air is it is the moment in a broadcast where the dj has nothing playing they're not talking there's no commercials it's that utter silence that you hear in the radio um it is the shame of every dj you know when you have dead air if there's other people in the office you'll hear them shout dead air you know it, it, it's <laughs> And people will point it out to you. You had dead air yesterday. I was like, yeah, I know. It's usually when I walk, you walk out to get something to drink and you forget the song is ending in 30 seconds. So yes, I've had dead air many, many times. <laughs> and your question sounds much more interesting. <laughs> Have you ever had an oxygen fail event while diving? Yes. And um, it's going to feature prominently, the circumstances in which that occurred are going to feature prominently in book four, actually. It oh. was while I was um, living in an undersea habitat um, in the Florida Keys. It's called, the, it's the, in, in reality, it's called Aquarius. It's um, the only undersea space station in the world dedicated to research. And you go and divers live underwater for 10 days at a time and they don't come back to the surface. And they dive for nine hours a day. And book four is going to feature a similar kind of um, type of activity. And I think some of one of these experiences will find its way into the book where, um, speaking of dead air, my buddy and I got bad air. Uh, right as sun was setting, we were a thousand feet away from the habitat, and which is a long way on diving. And we both got bad air and had to call for help. And um, our two buddies that were with us came from a different part of the reef got to us and had circumstances been different we we wouldn't have survived but because wow. everything worked we both survived and that was the first day of a 10-day mission and because every, all our training worked we all the mission continued but that story is going to find its way in much more detail to this book for oh wow awesome all right well michael this has been great thanks for yeah. the taking the lead on going the questions. I enjoyed this a great deal. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much. Thanks to those of you who were sitting out there and sending out in questions or appreciate it. And thanks Constance for your help. 
Of course, it was our pleasure. And then just before we say goodbye to everyone, is there any way I can throw in one more question for you guys of what are you currently working on and what can readers expect next from you? All right. Well, for me, as first? I start, you want me to take it? Yeah, go ahead, you start. So you can expect book one in three weeks, book two in a month, and book three <laughs> in a month and a half. <laughs> Then book four is going to take a little while, but that's in the near term. That's what you can expect. Okay. Awesome. So, so I am, um, I'm working on the first book of what's going to be a series. Um, I, James and I were just talking about this before the session. Um, and it's, it's going to focus on a small ensemble cast uh, in a small city, uh, small Delaware city. And uh, the whole series is going to be usually mostly a thriller suspense sort of thing. Um, but each book in the series is going to focus on a different character in the ensemble cast, but with the other characters being secondary characters. So each character will have their own opportunity to shine uh, throughout the series. Awesome. But uh, the, the first book, I'm working on it now, uh, about 35,000 words into it. I'm hoping to have mm -hmm. it. Um, my deadline to have it finished is roughly the end of October, which means it'll probably be finished roughly in January. Um, so. <laughs> right. well, um, well, perfect. So everyone, um, go ahead and keep a lookout for those. And don't forget for the books that are out now. And if you want signed or personalized book plates, we've got that link up there for you. But we are going to go ahead and say goodnight, everyone. And thank you for all of your questions. Bye. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you.